Global Watch International Call. It is May 20th, 2024, 6 a.m. Jerusalem time. And this hour is the journey, which is our weekly discipleship time. We are in week three of the School of the Watchmen. And uh, last week we review or we we uh, were doing part one of two parts called Spiritual Leadership in Days of Adversity. And we had a, um, or two acronyms or uh, acronym phrase, fit to fight. And we did the fit part last week. And so this week we're doing the fight part. So it's gonna be fun. We're gonna learn some stuff and, uh, and we're gonna have a good time. We're gonna see where we're at as watchmen in this whole fit to fight um, uh, scenario. So let us have, we need to have somebody open us up in prayer. Let us have the world renowned Utah from Germany open us up in prayer. Utah, go ahead. Okay, Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We honor your holy name. I thank you that it's not by might, not by power, but by your spirit. Thank you. We mm -hmm. surrender ourselves to you, Lord, and we thank you. We receive your mercy in times of trouble, Father. We are looking to you, Father. Thank you for eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand what you say, what you speak to our hearts today, Father, to stand in this battle, to stand in this fight, wherever we are, Lord, to stand together with Israel, Father. And I thank you that we can declare as David did, that the battle and the victory belongs to you in Jesus mighty name. Amen. 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 So good. All right. Well, um, my lovely wife has diligently been preparing for this and has a number of slides and uh, we're going to go into that. Is there, and I'm going to make comments here and there as you go through Susan. So is there anything that Anything else that you'd like me to say before you we get started with the slides? Well, no, I just would like to say to everyone on this line that you're all spiritual leaders and we're all a, a work in progress. Um, you are forerunners. If you're part of the watch, you're people who see the need to watch and to pray. And um, so I don't take lightly what I, I'm saying, nor does Fred. We're thankful that for each one of you, thank you for coming on and uh, bearing with us through this. But I think it's also a time because we're forerunners and moving into unprecedented waters that we've really got to have a foundation of what spiritual leadership is all about, uh, unless we get knocked off the rail like the enemy would like to, like us to with frivolous things or with... Uh, uh, conspiracy theories are all kinds of that's we're trying to avoid that in the, <laughs> in the global watch we're trying to keep us on the straight and the narrow and aligned with the lord in this hour and this time so that's all i would like to say okay i don't have anything great to add to that i think you you said it well mm. so go ahead why don't we just why don't we just go ahead and, and get started I'll jump here. right in and then if you have questions uh during the conversation please raise your hand or fred you can pop in anytime you feel like a yeah actually if people have during the presentation if you have questions put it in the chat mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and uh we we have a lot to cover and so we we need to get uh get started okay so fred i can't see the chat so if you see something come through you're gonna have to pipe in yeah i will <laughs> okay um well, last week we talked about being fit, how we prepare for the battles ahead. The F being faithful and faith-filled, I integrity, and T being able to work with one another in teams. So fit, faithful, integrity, and teamwork. And that's a um, really interesting combination. Why teamwork? And, and why is teamwork in this? Um, why isn't it like uh, teachability or things like that? Teamwork is because watchmen should not be alone. Watchmen, by their very nature, need to be connected. So we're going to be talking a little bit more about how that is important today. Um, 
But this week, we're going to be talking about fight. And there's a passage in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8, and verse 10, that really encompasses fight. And I'll just read it to you. Paul says, but also, or Peter says, for all also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, and perseverance godliness, and godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, in verse 10, it says, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. So I'm going to go right here to our slide presentation. <clears throat> and here we go. I need to just arrange things. This is where yeah, you so while you're while you're arranging things. Let me just say that our our purpose in this teaching is so that you will incorporate these, um, they're really uh, character traits and actions that follow them so that you will never stumble. We don't want any of the watchmen to be um, mm -hmm. to be stumbling. We want you to be strong in the Lord and absolutely perfectly equipped for the task at hand. Yes. So um <clears throat> Fight connotes how we deal with our challenges. And boy, we're going to have challenges ahead. We're facing new challenges today, even overnight, with the news that's coming out of Iran. So um, not only will we have international challenges, but the Antichrist spirit is rising up. Anti-Semitism, obviously, is a challenge for us all. And um, the Christian life is all about challenges, and especially now. So it is even more important to work on developing our spiritual muscle so that we can fight, uh, be fit to fight. And um, <clears throat> so we'll go on here. So what is fight all about? What's the, what's the acronym here? F is for the fear of the Lord. I is for innovation. G is for grateful and giving. H is humble and humorous. And T is trustworthy. So we're going to barrel right through all of these. I'll try to my best to give kind of a an understanding of each one of these things. So <clears throat> the fear of the Lord, when I started um, working on this, I thought, you know what, there's an example in the Bible that is just so powerful. And it's something we're, we're being centered on right now on the global watch is the spirit of Elijah. <clears throat> Some of you were with us on our journey to Israel uh, last April, and one of the things we did was we went to Tishbe um, because of that call of Elijah right now. And so these are some of the photos from it. This is the view um, right here of Tishbe right over into Israel. And, you know, my head just went to a spin thinking of a, a little boy that was woke up every morning looking at that, started wandering the hills exploring into the promised land. So he kind of knew his territory uh, growing up there and this, uh, some, of the, um, some, some of the dig there at Tishbe is very small, but uh, I was really struck with one thing there and it's this well. And we gathered around to pray and I don't know if anybody else felt it, but our, our group really felt it, that there was just, a spiritual dynamic that came down and um it was really a tender moment of prayer and intimacy with the lord right there at the well of tishbe <clears throat> so i'll go on into uh, talking a little bit more about elijah and the fear of the lord you know his story really teaches us something about the cycles of the fear of the lord that we all face and um uh, the first one is for <clears throat> the fear of the Lord. When we have it, we can definitely, in our situations, when we operate in the fear of the Lord, we're like Elijah pulling down <laughs> the uh, prophets of Baal in our in our own small little ways. But um, that was a confrontation where Elijah did not have the fear 
of man over him. He was operating under the fear of the Lord, challenging major opposition on that mountain in uh, Israel and uh, pulling down the prophets of Baal. But right after that, what happened? <laughs> it's a picture of what happens to us right after breakthrough. <clears throat> and um, it, it comes to in, a, in the form of pushback where we feel threatened or intimidated. It can happen right after a success as well. That's why breakthrough and success are very important issues to handle in our personal lives. If we don't handle success right, we can get derailed very quickly. Jenny Hager gave a very good, um, very good uh, uh, lesson on the dangers of success. So, but here Elijah was just a man, just like us. He was running for the fear of his life. He went into spiritual flight. And that spiritual flight and intimidation can absolutely exhaust us, like him under, like Elijah under the broom tree, <clears throat> but awakened by an angel putting a, a, a cake by his side. And he went into 40 years or 40 days of traveling in the wilderness in, in, in days of spiritual confusion, contending, all those things that break through and uh, intimidation can can bring upon us. He ended up on uh, Mount Horeb, and there <clears throat> he has a fresh encounter with the Lord. So he cycled back to being strengthened for spiritual breakthrough. And the fear of the Lord is very key, very key for all of us in, in being strengthened and fit for the fight. So what does the fear of the Lord do? It produces wisdom, Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It is, produces life, Proverbs 10, 27. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, and it endures forever, Psalm 19, 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. And it produces confidence. Um, Proverbs 14, 26. In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence. Well, Elijah exhibited all of these things in his life. And um, it was he, right after this time at Mount Horeb, God gives him instructions to go and anoint uh, Elisha and um, call him out for him to be the next generation to follow after him. So there was life that was produced from that. It endured forever and it produced, produced confidence not only in Elijah, but in Elisha in their lives that would ensue after that. So <clears throat> what does um, the fear of the Lord do? It produces, I believe, innovation. And a yes. faith. Go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, if I could just make a comment on um, on the whole issue of breakthrough, is that <clears throat> I just want to emphasize that right after breakthrough, uh, when we have mm -hmm. breakthrough, it's very exciting, and we feel like, wow, awesome, we've arrived. We can just you know let down our guard now, and that is, um, uh, we, and we've experienced this. <laughs> When we have done that, it's very easy to get some kind of a backlash that will um, that really will set us off course, and it will take us a while to get back up. So we just um, uh, we can celebrate the win, which is really important. But yes. we really have to be very careful to protect ourselves spiritually, protect ourselves, um, and uh, put on the armor of God. It's, uh, we can't emphasize that enough. And, and we, we're always having to be, we don't want to glorify the enemy. We always have to be aware that the enemy hates what we're doing. And especially when there's breakthrough, wants to uh, come in right away and steal it when we get it. So I just, I just wanted to, before we moved on to innovation, just wanted to mention that because it's just, we can't, we can't uh, emphasize it too much. 
Well, this this fear of man and this intimidation can come come on both the front end and on the back end of success of breakthrough, and uh, I'm I'm learning myself um, that I'm I, when I come under this pressure, this intimidation, this uh, yoke of weariness, um, I'm learning to listen to that because there's something coming that brings the breakthrough. And um, <clears throat> so that it, it, it happens on both ends. But I must also say that when we have breakthrough, when we get the testimony, that we must not forget it. Because um, that's when Israel lost it. They lost their faith. They lost their obedience to God when they lost their, the memory of what happens. That's why we do take time on this Global Watch to review our prophetic history, because I think for my, it, it points us to God, what God is wanting to do. When we review our history, we are wanting you to see what God has done so that you can, can begin to think about it and, and begin to understand what this call is all about. It's, it's not about Fred and Sue. It is about a call of God to prepare the way for his return. And so that history and that, that breakthrough is the testimony must be spoken. That's yeah, how we yeah. stir up our faith and how we get strategy about going forward. So yeah. I don't want anybody to be intimidated about that. Did you yeah. want to say something, Fred? Good, good point. No, no, go ahead. Please, let's go on okay. to intimidation. Okay. okay. In, in innovation. <laughs> <laughs> innovation <laughs> helps us get over the intimidation of the breakthrough. <laughs> but that is true. If we press through with the fear of the Lord and we get to that breakthrough, there is so much creative strategy. I can't imagine what went through Elijah's head in when he was confronting the prophets of Baal. Here are the, all this witchcraft around him, and he is under the strong anointing of the Lord. And so um, it, it, to prove his point, he pours water, not gasoline, water on this, on this altar. <laughs> <laughs> and allows the fire to consume it. That's pretty innovative in my mind. And that's the kind of leadership that I see rising up in you guys and in the watch, that they're innovative. You're thinking of new strategies on how to take your nation's new strategies for in intervention. We want to foster that kind of thing. In fact, when I'm around creative people, I am creative. And I, I pray that that... <laughs> <laughs> the watch is that place, birthplace for you. So um, innovation is very inspirational. And um, it, it, Jesus is our best example. <laughs> you know, all the things that Jesus taught it was so profound. It's so creative. Like he chose 12 unknown, untrained men to disciple. And they changed the world. If you start thinking about that, th that's just amazing. And that could only be God. And when he went to, this is a uh, photo of Caesarea Philippi. Um, when Jesus, mm, he thought, you know, it's about time that the, my, my disciples understand who I am and because it has everything to do what God wants to do in their lives. He takes them, what, 14 miles out of the way to Caesarea Philippi. As it's at the base of Mount Hermon, the mountain known for God's unity. At the base of it is all this idolatry. And I'm like, you just can't make this thing up. Jesus knew exactly what was there. And um, <clears throat> he takes them somewhere around here, I believe, this cave is the cave that they were probably sitting in front when Jesus said, who do you say that I am? It's known as the gate, gates of hell. <laughs> right there in front of the gates of hell, it was Peter who blurted it out, you, you're the Messiah. And Jesus turns to him, and upon your, your declaration, Peter, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And this is the site of this that very declaration so you talk about that that was pretty innovative of jesus to do it also fosters creative expressions in the bible 
the story of creation itself is very creative. I I often ponder how creative God was when I look at the various insects walking around on the ground beneath me, or or I look at the mountains and see the beauty of the Lord there. The creation story is filled with creati creativity, building the tabernacle of Moses, building the tabernacles, the temples was all a creative expression of God working through his people. And then of course, then there's creative strategies um, that are part of spiritual leadership. And uh, we've walked through several creative strategies, you know, this um, uh, starting this, this new year. And so Gideon's, but the Bible is filled with all these wonderful, I don't think there's a battle in the Bible that it doesn't proclaim some aspect of God and his victory over um, man, man, and God is glorified in it all. And I believe the stage is being set right now for God to intervene in the nations and uh, to glorify himself. Uh, greater works are yet to come. Guys, we, uh, I believe we're, into, we're coming into those days. Even as the darkness gets darker, guess what? His light is going to get brighter and we're going to be able to see it. So be leaning into God's heart, creative strategies for whatever you face. I believe we are going to be part of the company of people who will see those creative strategies, hear about them, do them, and see profound things begin to happen. We already have seen that. Um, Fred, do you have any in mind that you can relate in our history? But we've seen a number of creative strategies or creative responses of God to what we've, uh, we've um, done. Yeah, no, I no, just keep going because I, I think that it's <clears throat> innovation is very closely related to the prophetic ministry. And I think that you, you know, you have some things to say about that. So yeah. Um, and I hope we're all listening really hard and not taking uh for granted the prophetic ministry. I don't think any one of us on um, we're all have ears tuned to various prophets, but I'm I'm gonna speak to your hearts. God wants to create that prophetic ministry in your heart so that you can be the one who hears him and speaks. And many of you are, but um, we're all a work in progress. But why is that important now? Because um, we're, we're in an accelerated time and God wants to awaken the church. This is my own personal opinion, but I believe much of the awakening that needs to happen in the Western church is because the, the church has, by and large, locked out the prophetic voices. We've got a lot of great pastoral teaching, but where are the ministries of the prophets in the various churches? I don't see them. And I'm not sure about this, but it, I have two master's degrees in, in different uh, realms of ministry um, and I don't see um, pastors being trained on the pastoral ministry so the enemy would like to silence us and obviously for me uh, <clears throat> with what measure the Lord has given me I I have had to fight for my voice and you can hear it right now um, the enemy does not want me to speak <laughs> And I keep fighting it. And so here I am talking to you tonight. But anyway, we all have our battles. It's just that uh, my point is that the enemy hates the prophetic ministry. And he's wiped it out of much of the modern day church. Some of it is coming back. Yes, there is r r pathways being made for it to break open. But it is a tough going. And I'm asking us all that and praying for us all to have that wisdom to be engaged with the church and be able to introduce it in a healthy prophetic way so that the church can awaken. I don't think we're going to have the awakening without it. So Amos 3, 7 says, surely sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. Romans 4, 17, God who gives life to, to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did 
1 Corinthians 14, 1, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And tonight my prayer is that we all desire that gift and that we desire to use it in a helpful way, in a way that does not ablate the body of Christ or frighten the body of Christ, but brings them into that place of encouragement, empowerment, and that the prophetic gift is supposed to do. So <clears throat> what does um, that prophetic gift do? It, it causes us to be thankful and to be grateful in all things. Um, in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And Thessalonians is uh, written... And many of much of it is um, encompassed into the end time narrative. So it's very important for us to have gratefulness in all things. Now, um, gratitude, what, in, what does it require um, of us to have? Well, first of all, um, what does it need to, what does it do for us all? First of all, it gives us intimacy with the Lord. Um, we all know this, enter his gates with thanksgiving and in his course with praise, productivity, it gives us, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in all in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. It turns our mourning into dancing, Psalm 30, 11 to 12. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. Oh, Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. That's what happens when we turn our mourning into dancing. What a gratitude will do that. And it has to be honed. It's something that is grown. Um, and it can help us heal physically and spiritually. Luke 17, 15 is, um, uh, is a verse that speaks to that. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back. That was uh, one, of, one of the um, uh, lepers. Only one of them came back that was healed. He healed 10 of them. One came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And it throws in there, and he was a Samaritan. Now, Samaritans were a hated group of people in those days. That is a power encounter. <clears throat> and God healed him. Um, there are examples, uh, too, that the scriptures, I just want to speak to this just gently today. And maybe some of you may, I, I, would venture to guess if we were honest with ourselves, we have all had to deal with this um, in nursing embittered roots. Gratitude will get us out of that. Embittered roots can blind us. It can distort our spiritual perception. Um, the Hebrews speaks to this and warns us that pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness bringing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. And I just want to say one thing. Um, as we go into this, there's fruit from gratitude, uh, being grateful, the Gratitude attitude gives us certain um, uh, character traits that I don't think you can get without gratitude. And I'm going to tell you a little personal story that I'm not just speaking out of wind. <laughs> We've lived through this, but it is um, it produces generosity. The widow's might is a great story, and Jesus talks about you know, uh, watching people coming into the synagogue and what they're giving. 
and he sees this poor uh, widow come in and, and giving uh, what she gave. And he says, um, I say to you that this poor widow has put more than all those who have given to the treasury, for they all put in out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had, her whole livelihood. And that was something that Jesus rewarded. Um, gratitude keeps us aligned with God. It get, keeps us out of our own uh, self um, capabilities and keeps us leaning on the Lord and uh, dependent on him. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It feeds wisdom. Consider it pure joy, my uh, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, that per perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. That describes wisdom. And it fuels humility. It keeps us humble and mindful that where things come from. Um, Proverbs 29, 23 says, lift yourself up with pride and you will soon be brought low. But a meek and humble spirit will add to your honor. Um, there is a story just behind <clears throat> for us that I'll, where I felt like <clears throat> God threw the seed of gratitude into me and caused it to take root. And <clears throat> it was um, uh, after medical school. Uh, medical school is not cheap. <laughs> And Fred and I married the day after I graduated from medical school and we went through residency and um, <clears throat> uh, Fred went through a fellowship. And yes, you get paid on residency, but it's a, um, a widow's mite that you're paid. And um, I'll just stick, this is going to give glory to the Lord. It's not, please don't take it any other way. But we were a quarter of a million dollars in debt and had three kids on our hands by the time we were done with our, our fellowship. And um, I had no idea how God would absolutely get us out of this debt. We <laughs> were two, two uh, physicians, traveled to Bakersfield to set up our practices and settled in a 1500 square foot home with two bedrooms, one for three boys and one for us. <laughs> and that's where we lived. And there's a lot of stories I could tell you out of that. But as we continued to tithe and to give what we could, <clears throat> there was a day that a, a letter came. I can't help but weep over this. But um, my dad and my godfather, <clears throat> who was a close friend to our family throughout the years. They never had children. So they kind of adopted us. We're in um, the uh, World War II, the Battle of Guadalcanal together. And um, basically they covenanted together that they would take care of each other once the war was over. And um, so my godfather happened to pass away and I got this letter with a notice that I was in his will and that I don't know Fred I can't have to talk about this but the word came that we were getting abundantly more than we could ever think or imagine and we paid off all of our debt uh, 10 years 15 years of debt in a half an hour I wrote checks and we were out of debt that's how God answers prayer and faithfulness. That's how the fruit of gratitude in your work. And to this day, how does it impact me? Every time, I, I kid you not, every time I go to the grocery store, I am thankful, so thankful that I don't have to, you know, I, I that we have the money to do this. I'm mindful every time I buy something that, God, I'm so thankful that we can do this. Every time we give something, I am so thankful that we can give something. 
but it takes you going through these valleys of your life to hone that bat, um, that gratitude. And if any of you are struggling and you're down and you're mournful over it, I want to just speak life into that, to be grateful for what you have. Look at the resources that you have. Use them, hone them, because I promise you there is God that wants to give you exceedingly abundantly more than you could ever think or imagine. So that's my lesson on gratitude. And it, it has left a lasting impact on my life. Well, well said, dear. <clears throat> I have nothing I can really add to that, except that um, <clears throat> we do, we, uh, the opposite of gratitude is a complaining spirit. And, uh, and that can take you out of the presence of the Lord and can poison the well in a hurry. And uh, it, it absolutely does nothing to help you. And, uh, and so we are ones who just intentionally, it's, it's an act of your will. We practice uh, being thankful uh, constantly. And this keeps us walking in the presence of the Lord and, and, and keeps us attuned to his voice. This is incredibly important, uh, especially in these days when there's all kinds of difficulties happening going on uh, for maybe for you personally, but also for your nation and also in the world. And we can't um, let that what's happening in the news take, uh, take precedence over what uh, God says and his word and who he is in us. And um, so it's part of it, it. It leads to, you know, the joy of the Lord being our strength and uh, um, very, very important. We, you all know this, but it's, it's it can't be repeated enough. Yeah, and I think uh, along with that, uh, Fred, um, and this encompasses humility and uh, uh, innovation uh, along with uh, faith, but leaders create solutions and turn disappointment or problems into new uh, creative opportunities. And we want to cultivate that kind of attitude of gratitude and innovative spirit. Count von Zinzendorf, you know, he was exiled for 10 years from Herrenhut. Um, but he was noted to saying that he counted it as a, a blessing because it afforded him the opportunity to come to America and to, to go take, take the gospel to other nations. Now, how many would feel like saying that if they were exiled from their home <laughs> and put down by other leaders around them? A lot of us would be ruminating about what, what other people said about us. But we want to create a, cult a culture where we're problem solvers. And we're not going to be speaking about all the problems. We're going to speak in life and creative uh, solutions to what the, what the issues are. So enough said about that, because that all leads us to humility. It takes humility to be a creative problem solver. You know, pride will, will cause you to point the fingers. And Isaiah 58 is on our is on our core values. And take away the pointing of the fingers. Why? Because then you'll become healers of the breach and repairs of the streets to dwell in. So that's all part of the language we want to cultivate in the culture of the global watch. Humility yeah. re requires community. It requires us brushing up with other people and letting them test us and try us in every way we can. I, and I think um, I don't need, I have many stories about that and what God has helped me to learn uh, from. Um, but <clears throat> if you really want to talk to somebody who knows this stuff, talk to Fred, he gets it. I, and he's, Fred, you're an amazing leader that way. I just want to honor you that way because I've seen you be very humble in very difficult situations. And uh, um, what it has done is led to the fruit, which I believe culminates in wisdom. But anyway, um, 1 Peter 5, 5 through 7 says, yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves then under God's mighty hand, so that he will lift you up in his own good time. 
Leave all your worries with him because he cares for you. And that's why we can be humble. He cares for us. Ephesians 4.2, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Why? Because you know what? Jesus is patient with us in many, many ways. Amen. So <clears throat> what? Did you have something? Amen. Amen. So what is humility? It's basically strength under control. And um, when God calls us, we, we should not re refuse him because we feel inadequate. We're all inadequate. He is our adequate. He is our adequacy. And when we realize that, then we're truly humble. <laughs> when we think we can do something, then it's like danger, danger. You know, be careful where, who you're relying on, him or yourself. So in Paul, uh, his progression of humility is outlined in the scriptures. Here it is, 1 Corinthians 15, 9. I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle. Ephesians 3, 8, I am less than the least of all of God's people. The last step, 1 Timothy 1, 15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I, whom I am the worst. Do you see the progression there? So we are all a work in progress. Let's not be intimidated out of it, but continue to lean into the Lord and learn from him his lessons of humility, and know that he is a God who recovers us and uh, does not want us to fail. He wants us to be successful. And so one of the greatest successes in Christianity is when we can laugh at our enemies, laugh at our circumstances, laugh at our mistakes, laugh at each other without hurting each other, and enjoy the ride that God has for us. Um, there is a, a quote from uh, a minister called uh, Jay Hallett. The most successful leader is the one who possesses a keen sense of humor combined with a clear sense of God's grace. I think that's a great st statement. Um, <clears throat> laughter, uh, Psalm 126, too. It, um, <clears throat> it signifies a heart that's full of thankfulness and appreciation for all the, the, the wonderful thing God, God has done. Psalm 126, two says, then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. That's the nations looking at Israel, okay? And then Israel turns around and says, then Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. So first, it, it's looking out at somebody else that the Lord has done, and you're laughing at them, because you're, or you're seeing that they're laughing. And then you turn around and you sing, oh, he can do the same thing for me. So first it's them, and then it's us. It's a sustaining force in our life. Romans 12, 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. And it provides health. Proverbs 17, 22. A merry heart does good like medicine. And boy, is that ever true. Um, uh, Fred, you can probably speak into this, but I, I feel like people who struggle with depression can awful, often struggle with other health issues. Um, people who are critical can often struggle with health issues. I have some testimony in that. Uh, from other uh, just personal examples, but I, I won't get into them. But it is healthy. It's healthy for us to take a break and have a laugh at us. When we make a state, mistake, don't go running into your bedroom and start crying or thinking, oh, God, you know. Yeah, we can do that. We can be exasperated with ourselves, but start laughing at yourself and you'll see, see the healing power of God begin to, to work in your life. Um, yeah, I would say we, we need to take, um, <clears throat> we need to maybe take ourselves not quite so seriously. Mm -hmm. We need to take God seriously, but not necessarily ourselves. 
the other thing about humor that I've found is that uh, humor oftentimes uh, breaks <laughs> up uh, uh, an intense or a tense um, conversation that you might be having with people. If yeah. you can use humor, it just, it disarms people and it just, it brings things back in the direction of where they should be. Well, it's a unifier. Yep. And it can blast through very difficult situations and bring people that are very far apart onto the talking table again. Absolutely. <clears throat> so uh, the one last thing is T that's trustworthy. And this is, I can't even begin to talk about this. This is something worth having a whole session or series on, but there's trustworthiness in our trust in God and there's trust, trustworthiness with one another. And I can tell you that the more we learn to have trustworthiness with one another, um, <clears throat> I think it goes hand in hand with growing our trust in God. Um, it takes a lot of trust in God sometimes to work with our with enemies or people that oppose us. It requires us to rely on the Lord. And it's in that that's that place that he, God hones our character and the fight within us to make us to make us more like him. Um, <clears throat> Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord and whose confidence is in him. And trustworthiness with one another, Proverbs 12, 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are his delight. Trustworthiness is extremely important in the watch with one another. That's why it's important to walk in good order. We've just walked through that with the launch of the Oceana watch. And we're growing in the understanding and how to develop these watches. And so there's got to be a lot of grace within this. But um, uh, Jenny Hager has walked that group through in such good order, even through difficult situations, difficult, uh, um, different situations. They're walking in good order. And I, I believe that there's a powerful uh, watch coming out of that as a result of walking in good order. And it, there's too much to say about that before I, I, it would take too much time tonight. But trustworthiness, trustworthiness with one another is very important in the watch as we develop teams of trust, communities of trust, and uh, just working so that that innovative spirit has a safe place to land. And finally, I just want to say, what is the result of the fight? <clears throat> We're circling right back to the beginning. First Peter 1, 5 through 8 and 10. And I'll just read his word because take it as a, take it as a seal to this conversation. And I pray uh, uh, an open book for your lives. It is for my life. Life. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 10, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. And finally, he, what does it yield? For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. But blindness is in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. If we get fit to fight what's coming, if you take all of the, if we take all of this thing and ponder it in our hearts and we create a, a, a spirit and a character and a culture fit to fight, revival will happen. 
the doors of Israel will open to trust, to trustworthiness, to trustworthy people. And guess what comes, what follows? Salvation will come to Israel. And what happens then? The end time narrative will unfold. It'll be a key to the door. <clears throat> Amen. That's it. Amen. <clears throat> well said, my dear. Great, uh, great message. <clears throat> we have time for, uh, we have time for Jenny Hager to give her, um, her rebuttal uh, to your talk. No, I, I, wait, wait, no rebuttal. My hat's off to her because this was a lesson in walking out, uh, you know, very difficult situations, tenuous situations with humor, with grace, with understanding at great cost. But the produce, the fruit of this is going to come forward. And I not only see the Oceana, but now it's wa washing over into India. This dragon is being loosed. Yeah. And the sound of salvation is being sent. I was kidding. Humor. Humor. So, um, <laughs> all right, Jenny, go ahead and give us your, give us your, uh, your thoughts. And then we'll have uh, one or two people pray and then we'll. We're going to go right into the um, Heronhood uh, prayers. So, Jenny, go ahead. Well, I think I need humor at the moment because I'm in a bit of a backlash over Oceana. But, um, you know, things like the printer won't work, the iron won't work, the DVD player won't work, I'm under, I've got flu, that sort of thing. But this is where I think... Um, this is where the test is, don't grumble, pray. all the things you're saying, this is like, um, this is where that inner strength of the Holy Spirit is the thing that keeps us going. My comment today, you've put a lot of work into this, Sue, but we've just gone a trip around the Bible, you've put so much into this, and I believe that what the Lord is doing through these teachings, he is helping us not to be shut down. There is a strong spirit at the moment coming from Jezebel, all to do with the um, Elijah-Jezebel conflict, to shut us down. And often when you shut down, it, this can come through your dearest friends or mm -hmm. anybody. It doesn't, you know, People don't come aggressively and shut you down. They just say things. And this is where it, you can begin to think, oh, maybe doubt starts to come in and maybe... Because most people in church land do not understand the call to Oceana. So if it wasn't for Global Watch, we would not have launched. I, none of us would have been strong enough to have come together and to have launched the Oceana Watch. But because Global Watch understands what we're sharing, you know, we're saying this is what the Lord is saying to us. And Sue has this incredible gift of putting it all together so then we were able to push back against that shutdown. The dragon is trying to shut the work down. So we have to recognize that bless those who haven't seen the vision. So whatever he's saying to any of you to do, just push back against that shutdown because it, it's a spirit that tries to strip you of your authority in Christ and strip you of what God is asking you to do for him and strip you of the ability to gather a team together as ordained by the Lord to do what the Lord wants to do. So um, I, I just thank you so much, Sue and Fred, for the strength and the revelation that Global Watch gives us and that um, under the canopy of of the Global Watch, the, the Lord is significantly using Global Watch against that pushback of, of Jezebel. And um, yes, I think everybody be encouraged and just push back. Thanks. Yeah, so, and, amen, Jenny. And I, I, we're again, you know, we've said this before, but we're honored that you would even with all the experience and all the authority and all the things that you have done that you would even want to be participating with the Global Watch. And it really is, um, again, it's not about Susan and me. It's about, um, it's about God moving and with all of us together, 
I think he's provided uh, a certain spiritual covering that um, that is uh, that enables you to do what you're doing. So I'm just going to pray for you right now for because the Oceana uh, watch that that whole concept and what you're doing is definitely from the Lord. There's no question about it. The enemy not only wants to discourage, it wants to, not only wants to strip us of our authority, which he always does after a breakthrough. And um, but he also wants to discourage us and and put plant seeds of doubt, or and then it, and then he always brings up all these past times when when things haven't gone so well and you failed or you've you know you know you haven't done things right and he's the first to you know yap yap yap. So we just say thank you, Lord. We just uh, everybody just spiritually just hold out your hands towards Jenny and we just say. Father, we just bless you. We bless you, Jenny, in the name of the Lord, in the name of Yeshua. And we thank God for you. You are a great example to us. You're a great inspiration to us. We just declare his favor is over you, surrounds you as with a shield. We just thank you that you do have that Sons of Issachar anointing, that you know the times and the seasons, and you know what to do about it. And... Uh, that God has given you great wisdom through the years. And we just declare over you this, no weapon formed against you will prosper in Jesus name. No weapon formed against you will prosper. That uh, Psalms 91, the Lord is hiding you in the shelter of his wings that no harm would come to you, no destruction near your tent. And we say, you know, a thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. And, uh, and we just declare over you uh, continuous breakthrough, not just a little bit, but continuous, and that the joy of the Lord is your strength. And we thank you that you're not alone in, in the whole Oceana thing, but you have a team around you who is supporting you and loving you. And we say that, um, that this Oceana is going to be tremendously successful, and it's going to be um, uh, something that's going to shift things in uh, in in all of Oceana, and and we say it's uh, just right in time, uh, right in the midst of great difficulties and all the things that are going on worldwide and all the threats that are coming against all these Oceana nations. So um, so we're again we're thankful and by faith we just say that uh, that we can't wait to hear the testimony of all the things that are are going to happen as a result of this watch. It's been launched. And it's going to be, and it's going to go through, and it's going to be strengthened in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So uh, let us have. Um, we need to have somebody close us off in prayer. We're at the end of the hour, amazingly, and then Sue will. Um, will we stop may. Recording. We, we may do a, a session. Um, we've got we've got a couple of open slots we may do a session where we can discuss this a little bit more i'm sure yeah. this stirred up things within people i i just don't want this ball to drop i just don't want to teach and have nothing you know no discussion so it, it, we'll be looking at that uh in the in the next few weeks here too yep okay all right the world-renowned uh shirley momberg from south africa has a comment before we close go ahead or a prayer or both yeah, or, thank you. Or maybe all three. <laughs> <laughs> amen, amen. Sue, so, um, I just, I love the way you teach. I love the way that you bring the word of God, that you make it, um, you break it down for us. You really do have a gift of a teacher. Um, yes, you have so many other things upon your life, but today's message was profound. And you you couldn't speak on Friday. You, 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 you had so much against you. And I mentioned to you last week mm -hmm. that in our prophetic training last year, there was still a prophetic word that the enemy is trying to steal your voice and has tried so many times. And so one of the things I want to just say to everybody on this call and that we'll watch later is we just will keep speaking over the global watch and its founders that God's perfect will and plan will be done. And we just trust God for his healing, for his breakthrough. And when when the enemy comes, you know, there's, there's two different ways that I've heard this taught. When the enemy comes like, uh, in like a flood, God will raise a standard. 
But I've also heard when the enemy comes in, like a flood, God will bring a standard, you know. I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to really do this, but I just felt to actually declare this in a recording. Jenny, when you and your team launched the Oceana last week, the Lord put something on my heart and I put it in the chat. I did send it to you, but I do feel to actually speak it. Could I actually do that, Fred and Sue? It's, yes, it's, of course, please. It's, not, it's not long. This was the word that the Lord gave me to speak over the launch. And so, I mean, just look at Jenny. I mean, just look at this woman of God, this incredible powerhouse, this, this um, grandmother to all of us, this mother to all of us. And it, this is what the Lord just put on my heart. Congratulations on the launch of the Oceana War Room. The name echoing with spiritual acuity and strategic acumen signifies more than just a title. It is a beacon of hope, a testament to your unwavering faith and a symbol of your collective resilience. This momentous occasion marks not just a new chapter, but a pivotal epoch in your journey. And this applies to the Global Watch as well. This is not merely a launch. It is a dawn of a new era, an era of spiritual and prophetic stewardship. It is a call to arms for all to rise. As you embark on this journey, remember that your efforts will bear much fruit. Each prayer, each decree, proclamation, conversation, each moment of reflection in the Oceana War Room will plant seeds of change, nurturing your community and fostering a culture of unity and mutual respect. So as you step forward into this new era with faith and a shared vision in your hearts, knowing that your efforts in the Oceana War Room will echo throughout eternity. Congratulations once again on this remarkable achievement. Wow. Amen and amen. Amen. What, what a great word. Well, I just want to say, when the pressure's on and you feel the pushback, go back to fit to fight. There'll be an answer there. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Jenny, do you have anything that you want to add to that? You have to unmute yourself. Well, just the Shirley's word really, really encouraged us. Uh, it, it, it was wonderful. And I, I know from experience that when you get a strong backlash, you should be very encouraged. Um, yeah. It does mean that we have had a major, major breakthrough. So I'm very encouraged in that sense, very, very much. But again, it you mentioned team team it, it's such an honor to have a good team around you it, it's just you know the lord that's that's a gift from god to have a, a team that's united and standing with you and understanding and you know it's it's rich it's one of the rich keys of the kingdom so i'm just very very grateful amen amen so good. All right. So Shirley, why don't you, um, you get to have the last word. So why don't you close us off in prayer and then we'll go right into the, uh, into the here and hut, um, prayers. Yes, Lord. So as this two part series, um, concludes, Lord, we just thank you for Fred and Sue for bringing this incredible, um, teaching to us and, there's something on the the innovation that um, you know Fred popped a note earlier, and yeah, I just woken up and sleep <laughs> sleep out of my eyes. But you know who's who, who is such a remarkable innovator, and and both of you sat under his teaching and in his church for a long time, and that was John Maxwell, John oh, C. Yeah. Maxwell. Yeah. Yeah, yes. And if mm -hmm. if we just look at how he teaches in the world in 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 the marketplace but then he also has the ministry and one of his one one of his quotes or, or 
it's it's not a quote, but one of the things that he talks about is um, the law of the lid. And where it talks about that leadership ability determines the effectiveness of an entity and innovative leaders raise the lid by fostering creativity, adaptability, and forward thinking. Mm -hmm. So Father, we just thank you that that is one of the, the things that the Global Watch does and does well. Lord, thank you that uh, it is being stewarded with grace. It is being stewarded with excellence. Father, thank you for the, the many that are, are rallying and are answering the call, not just answering the call, but understanding that this is a call. The watchman, the call of the watchman is a call. And so, Father, we just thank you for these words that have been spoken, these seeds that have been sown, and we thank you, Lord, for much fruit in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Um, we're going to, we're going to, you can get off the line if you want right now, but we're going to go right into Sue.